I know. Well, think of the bright side. At least OU. Can I start, or, or do I wait for it? He's gotten better over the years. That was the kind of thing that. Oh I have my leftovers too. Why do you? <laughs> All right. Well, can I see this? Call the Broken Arrow Municipal Authority special meeting to order. Roll call. Thank you. Green. Here. Ford. Here. Parks, Here. Gillespie, Here. Wimpy. Here. Uh, first item on the general authority business is 3A, consideration, discussion, and possible approval of Grand River Water Supply Study Alternatives Recommendation. Ethan. You are not Kenny. You are Ethan. Yes, I am. Good evening, Dory. Madam Chair, Person, Vice Chair, Trustees, uh, Mr. Spurgeon, Ethan Edwards, Director of Engineering and Construction for the City of Broken Arrow. So, a little history here. Back in August of 2021, uh, staff made a presentation to the authority regarding uh, the long-range study that was completed by HDR back in 2017. Um, the purpose of, of the staff's presentation um, was to obtain authorization to proceed with this Grand River Water Study um, to evaluate alternatives for a second water source, including phasing options um, for a potential long-term project, um, which we did bring that uh, contract with HDR back to the authority, I believe, in March of 2022. Um, tonight we have uh, Joel Cantwell and Christy Shaw uh, with HDR. Um, they're here with us to uh, help present the findings of the study. Um, and as you may recall, HDR was the uh, consultant for the water treatment plant, and they have been a long-term partner with both the city and the authority. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Schwab to give a little bit of history on the project. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Um, so the history of Broken Arrow Water has been going on for quite some time. And if we go ahead and go to the PowerPoint, um, this is a PowerPoint that HDR consultant has put together. And I get the fun stuff. I get the first two slides, and they tell me to sit down. <laughs> so if we go to the, the history line, the timeline, our first real water in Broken Arrow uh, came from Ray Harold, the springs. Everybody knows Broken Arrow's history on the springs. There's a little pond, lake out there, if you will, and we built a pump house in 1909. That was our first bond as a community, a revenue bond. So 1909, we built a pump house and pumped half a million gallons a day to a water tank that stood about where Mr. Spurgeon's office is. Um, that tank was basically uh, served our water supply until 1967. Rogan Air Expressways opened up, our population's blowing up, and in 1967, obviously we started the design a few years ahead of time. Um, we designed a new water treatment plant, opened it actually in January of 67, 4 million gallons a day. Our population took off quickly, and by 1976, we needed more water. The plant was overstressed. Uh, in 1970, we were 11,787, I believe. In 1980, we were 35,761. So you can see the big growth in there. We already had our first plant expansion nine years into it and moved it up to 10 million gallons. At the same time, that's when disinfection byproducts were discovered in 74, and uh, they began to get regulated. We were still growing. We switched from a treatment plant 
at the Virgo River and then became a purchased water system. We'd enter into a, I believe it was a 31 year agreement with UWA. And by the way, we do have members of UWA here tonight. We'll introduce them a little bit later. Um, but we entered into a 31 year agreement to purchase treated water. So they were treating it at their, their water treatment plant. Um, they're just outside of Pryor in the Mid-America Industrial Park and sending it to us. By 1982, January, we took the water and we were on that until 2014. So back up about 10 years earlier, maybe 11 years earlier, uh, we started doing a long range plan. What are we gonna do for our citizens of Broken Arrow? So you can see it takes a while to get to that end result. And we went through a citizen committee, we went through piloting, we went through design, um, review of DEQ and all the other permitting agencies, and we built a new plant and it opened in April of 2014 at 20 million gallons a day. But we have a huge investment in that line that comes from UWA, uh, Oklahoma Ordnance Waterworks uh, Agency Authority, to us. Um, like I said, it was, we built it in 1982, and, uh, or built it before it became operational in 82. It's still in the ground. We are still owners of that line. What do we do with it? So even before the plant became operational in 2014, there was always a discussion, do we use it for raw water? Do we buy more uh, treated water from UWA and supplement? How do we do this? So it's always been in the process in the back of our mind, and as Ethan said in August of 2021, the governing body authorized us to enter into an agreement with HDR to take a look at how can we implement, what do we do with that next phase. So that's kind of where we are tonight uh, with their contract. They're going to recommend um, what our next steps are. Next slide. So what are the drivers? Uh, as, as we said right now, we rely on one water source, a vertigree river. We treat it, we have the ability, actually we've made an expansion to the plant since that timeline and we can actually treat up to 30 million gallons a day. Um, so we have a 30 million gallon a day treatment plant on the Verdigree River, but we only have one source, no backup. We are tied into Tulsa, uh, Tulsa Metropolitan Utility Authority. We have two major tie locations with them, one along 41st or Dearborn, um, probably about where Elm would go through if it went through. We have a tie-in there that uh, comes into the north side of town. Then we have another tie-in with them, um, really at, 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 let's see, that's Olive and Albany, 61st and, and 129th, we have a tie-in. Um, so we can get treated water from Tulsa to help supplement. It's really a supplemental, and that's what it is intended to be. But w what do we do moving forward with our investment? So that's what's on tap tonight. Um, some of the drivers I said is really, um, the Virgo River is a navigational channel. The furthest inland port in the United States is in uh, Catoosa. Uh, with that port, it's about 97, 98% built out. A lot of industry, a lot of uh, potential challenges for our water if, we, if there's a spill or a major uh, contamination and we're down to one source, we would have to tie over to Tulsa to pick up theirs. Um, that's one of the biggest issues. Adams Creek, which ties into right where we get our water out of the vertigree, it's still kind of shallow. We have a lot of algae blooms, taste and odor. Uh, knock on wood, we haven't had one since Charles Vokes started in September of <laughs> five years ago. Uh, that was our last major taste and odor issue. Um, but it's not. It's not a fact of you're not going to have them. It's when's the next one. And it's really, truly driven by algae. Um, potential OWRB curtailment of existing water rights. So we're going to talk about the water rights here in a minute. And Christy Shaw from HDR will touch on that. So those are a lot of the big drivers. What's our need? We've already talked about it. Another source, uh, redundant su supply source line. So, and flexibility in water quality. Right now, the Grand River, uh, Lake Hudson, where we'd be talking about getting water, um, HDR will talk about that water chemistry and how it's potentially better for us than the vertigree and gives us some flexibility. So that's what's up tonight, and at this time, I'll turn it over to Christy Shaw. Thank you, Kenny. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the water rights that 
the City of Broken Arrow currently has. And then I'm also going to give an update on the demand projections. As part of the study that we recently did, we looked at forecasting those demand projections out to 2070. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the existing water rights. Yes, 2070. We're it's a long way away. We won't be here, but we'll <laughs> <laughs> Setting up for future success, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, right now there are two uh, water rights on the Verdigree River. Um, those that have a priority date back in 1963 and the second one, 1978, combined those two allow you to use uh, on average 24.3 million gallons per day with a max diversion of 30 MGD. And that 30 MGD coincides with your treatment plant capacity as well. Um, back when we did an, an initial study um, back in 2015 as part of the long range water supply plan, um, we had identified a need for future water. And at that time, it coincided with the receipt of a letter from the Oklahoma um, Water Resources Board that basically said, we don't think you guys have been using all of your water rights. And on a seven to nine year basis, they review all of the water rights um, that are under their jurisdiction, and then they can recommend curtailment. Um, and that also was around the same time frame that Broken Arrow made as very significant investment in your water treatment plan. So in response to that letter of curtailment um, potential, there was a, a request that was put in in 2015, and that pending that permit is still pending um, on the vertigree. Uh, but that was for a average use of 15.8 MGD and a max diversion of 20 MGD. I'm going to talk a little bit about the agency coordination after I review just a couple of slides here. Um, but we did reach out recently to OWRB and talk a little bit about the letter that had been issued that had been unresolved and kind of their take on that, as well as this third water right. You may recall that earlier this year, um, Ten Kiriller Ferry Lake, there was a, a uh, permit that was basically released earlier this year. Um, there were many reasons for that, um, including the fact of the distance that Ten Killer Ferry Lake was. Also, part of the reason why uh, they were talking, um, OWRB hadn't gone forward with considering that third uh, permit or the pending request was because they had cited the Ten Killer Ferry Lake um, permit and saying that there was enough water for Broken Arrow into the future. <coughs> One thing about Ten Keller Ferry Lake that was a really important distinction is that even though you had a water right, that that didn't have any storage that went behind it. So it was a run of the river rights, wasn't firm, and so that was released back in earlier this year. So the two water supply um, water rights that you have are the Verdigree River and then also through contracted supplies receiving water from Tulsa. So this is kind of a messy and, and busy graph here, but I wanted to just kind of walk through it. This is the 2070 projections. The dashed lines are showing what your average day water use is anticipated to be now and moving onward to the future. The red line above it talks about the peak day. Um, roughly, take home message is that in 2070, we're anticipating that your average day water use is gonna be around 23 MGD and your peak water use is gonna be around 46 MGD. So in the previous slide, we showed, yep, we've got average day pretty much covered, but you don't have the peak day covered, and you wanna be able to plan for those, those conditions moving forward. Um, the, the background that you might see is the, the coloring um, is your current water supplies. So in the past, you relied on UWA treated supplies, and then in 2014, those were discontinued. There was a 36 inch line coming from UWA and the city of Broken Arrow migrated towards using the um, Verdigree River solely and, and having your water treatment plant and then expanding that treatment plant to 30 MGD. So it shows in the blue, the Verdigree River water rights up to the 30 MGD and then TMUA, the treated water of about five MGD on top of that. So what you'll notice is that between 2040 and 2050, you have a shortfall. Um, actually around like 2042 or so, you, you might be seeing that shortfall. So what we're doing today is we're gonna frame and, and talk a little bit about 
what water supplies we evaluated in order to address that shortfall and give you guys some redundancy and reliability. <clears throat> so the agency coordination, this ended up being a really significant um, part of our study. Uh, we, we reached out to the Oklahoma Water Resources Board, inquired about the third um, permit, and, and that was still pending. That is still a pending status um, at this point, um, and they, they are wanting to see where the need is, basically. Um, we did receive some good news that they were not actively seeking to curtail your first two water rights. And that's great news. Um, <clears throat> It doesn't, however, protect you for the future, necessarily. So it's working now, and they see that there is a need for those water supplies um, moving forward, but because they have this cycle, that's gonna be revisited in the future. So um, that communication and relationship continues forward. We also reached out to the Grand River Dam Authority. We had identified potential water supplies back in 2015 and then with the update in 2017. But since then, they've actually completed a water supply plan. And so we wanted to see, do you guys have any water available? And there was a presentation that was made in November of last year that did confirm that um, they do have water available. In fact, that only um, half of the water that's being available is currently being used and that their water availability is basically three times what the amount is that's contracted today. So um, they, they do have water. And then we also had additional conversations with um, Oklahoma Ordnance Works Authority or Mid-America Industrial Park. And those were very favorable conversations. Um, we went on a field trip. We got to see their infrastructure and learn a little bit about um, what they're anticipating in the future. During those conversations, um, we learned that they have contracted supplies that are in excess of what their needs are moving forward and that there's up to 25 MGD that's available. Um, and given the, the infrastructure that's currently in place with the 36 inch line um, and, and the, the infrastructure as part of um, UWA's system that represented a really good opportunity for partnership moving forward. <clears throat> Another part of our study is we took a look at four raw water sampling locations. Three of them were in the Grand River and one in the Verdigree River. Um, keeping in mind that this was one data point, but we wanted to be able to identify any kind of red flags or fatal flaws early on. Um, one take home that we got from this is the importance of continued monitoring because there may be seasonal fluctuations and changes in the water chemistry that we'll want to be thinking about. And as Broken Arrow moves towards um, considering this new water supply, it's really important to understand blending and what that impact might look like. So this is kind of a precursor to the blending studies and jar testing and bench scale testing that would be necessary before you integrate a new water source. Everyone's heard about Flint and we don't wanna have an occurrence like that. So um, the, basically what we found is that the Verdigree River water has total organic carbon um, that is a bit higher than uh, what we're seeing in the Grand River. Um, so the Verdigree water is sometimes more challenging to treat um, and that, that the Grand River, by bringing that on, it's gonna kind of alleviate some of that. Um, and we'll meet, need to change some of the, the pH of the water coming in from the Grand River, but at this particular time, there's no real red flags from a public health perspective. We also wanted to assess the pipeline. So the pipeline is a 36 inch pipeline that is um, basically from the, the the UWA pump station is shown there, um, which is owned by Broken Arrow, and then it goes over to the water treatment plant. Uh, it is 21.3 miles long. There's two sections of it. The first section that is furthest away from uh, the water treatment plant um, is the 10.3 mile line, and it's had some, some problems in the past, some historical breaks uh, in that section. It was installed at the same time and the same type of, of, of concrete pipe, but it was a different manufacturer. And so the Interpace 
Corporation um, has had some some issues across the across the country with some of their installed piping, um, and this is no different from that. Um, but what we have seen is that Section Two, the 11 mile pipeline, doesn't really have a history of breaks. But we wanted to do both a desktop assessment by looking at the history of that, also looking at the as builts, and then we wanted to do kind of a visual inspection out in the field. So that was done. As part of that um, inspection that was done in the field, there were a bunch of tests that were run um, looking at soil resistivity, kind of the per particulars of, of the areas and trying to determine the corrosivity of the area. So, you know, what are the, what do the soils look like? What, what does, you know, the portions of the pipeline look like? It was not fully exhaustive, but looked at several different areas to kind of gauge a little bit about what the replacement might look like um, or rehab. So in a nutshell, what we had discovered through that work um, and doing hydraulic analyses is that you, you're able to get about 12.3 MGD through that line under gravity circumstances. Anything beyond that up to 25 MGD, you need to pressurize that. So you'd have to restore the pump station. Um, and also that, you know, the first section, it was a bit cheaper to go ahead and, and replace that um, over rehab. It would give you that peace of mind moving forward as well. So one thing that we need to be done in moving forward, though, is to do that internal condition assessment make some verification of, of that entire pipeline before you replace it. But generally at this point, it looks like that first line would be, section one would be the first part to, to replace as looking at phasing of this project in the future so that you could use that for gravity. And then as you're growing into the demand, then you'd be able to restore the pump capacity and also um, do the rehab on section two in order to get that to deliver the 25 MGD in the end. <coughs> Now I'm going to head and hand it over to Joel Cantwell. He's going to talk a little bit about the alternatives evaluation and what we had looked at and the costs and the selection moving forward for can recommendation. I, can I ask a question just real quick? So um, if we were to replace the sure. pipe, would we make it a bigger pipe as well as new pipe? We looked at just replacement of the 36 inch and that would allow you to be able to um, deliver the 25 MGD moving forward, which is what we had determined would get you through 2070. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Joel Cantwell. And, you know, Christy and I have both been working with the city since, gosh, 2007, I believe, on the water supply. And back then, so, we, you know, we appreciate being back here again to talk with you guys. You know, it's you have a great staff, and they're, they're really good to work with. And we've enjoyed working with them over the years. Before I get on to my stuff, I, I want to add one more thing to that, that question you just asked. So, you know, we, we did look at this with them. But Kenny actually had the idea, you know, what, how much could we get by gravity if we put a bigger pipe in there? So we looked at going from a 36 to a 42. You get pretty good. I think you can get almost three more MGD out of it. When you go to a 48, you can get about, I don't know what, one and a half more maybe. And then beyond that, it's just diminishing returns. So there are possibilities. We just looked at a little bit right there at the end. Okay, so all the data that Christy talked about that we gathered, the analysis we did, uh, at that point then we wanted to put together a set of alternatives to evaluate against each other uh, to make a decision here. And we really have three major alternatives we looked at, three scenarios. The first of this we call alternative zero. That is the status quo, the current plan, only treating the verdigree. Under that alternative, you would not develop the Grand River. You just leave the pipe in the ground and move forward with the verdigree. Uh, that's looking over there in that far right column. You can see how that 46 MGD that Christie showed is your peak day demand in 2070, that's what we're trying to achieve. So that would all come from the verdigree. Those two current permits plus that third permit we talked about would cover that. Alternative one is a partnership with UWA. And we broke that down into an A and a B. So the A is everything you can deliver by gravity. 
and that's about 12.3 MGD. Again, if we upsize the pipe, we could may potentially get more. But we re really looked at keeping that at 36. B is if you went ahead and pumped that water so you could deliver that maximum 25 MGD that they have available. The um, alternative two is instead of a partnership with UI, it would be a partnership directly <coughs> with GRDA, who, who owns that intake on the river. And so we looked at delivering, we, there's not really a gravity solution for that, so we looked at delivering 25 MGD, a pump solution from there. And you know, under both 1B and 2, when you're delivering 25 MGD of the Grand River, that, that can essentially become your primary water source at that point, and then the verdigree would supplement it during peak times. So just a little bit, on that first alternative, alternative zero, the, you know, that's where you're not going to the Grand River, you're just sticking with the verdigree. And so to get to that 2070 demands, there are three major things you would have to do. That first bullet there is expand the intake pump station on the verdigree. Right now it's 30 MGD and it would expand that to 46. And then that graphic on the far right is basically an outline of a larger reservoir that would be to the west of your current plant site. And that, that was back way back in our 2015 water supply plan. And that would need to be constructed just to have that storage in case there are some of the things happen, like Kenny talked about, if there's a spill on the river or there a bad outbreak or something happens on the verdigree, you have stored water there without a second source. And then the third thing is to expand the water treatment plant, 46 MBD. And just understand all of these alternatives, even if you bring Grand River water over, you still have to expand that plant. So that's really going to be common to all of these. This map is a little bit busy, but it shows Alternative one, this is that partnership with UWA and really what would be involved. And if we start up at the top right-hand corner of that graph, um, you can see the GRDA pump station there, and there's kind of a dashed blue line that goes to the UWA plant one. So that, that is UWA's infrastructure. And per discussions with them, they would deliver water to that point where that yellow line begins. And that yellow line would then need to be constructed by Broken Arrow to take that, take that water from UWA and deliver it over to the top of the red line, which is your existing pipeline. So that's really that connection between UWA and, and, and your pipeline. And then from there, the water under 1A would travel by gravity down to the water treatment plant. And under 1B, you would have a, a new pump station right there where the yellow line connects to the red, and then that would pressurize it out. Now, you do have that old abandoned pump station right there. So we've assumed cost of building a new one, but it would be possible to potentially rehabilitate that existing one. That would just have to be evaluated. I mean, it's not in good shape right now. Um, this is alternative two, the, the uh, option to just contract directly with GRDA. And you can see that green line from their intake, and that's an existing 36-inch pipeline that GRDA has. And it terminates at, you can kind of see a blue there, that's a reservoir that they have. And so they, they pump water there for cooling water, but there's a lot of extra capacity in that line. And so our assumption was GRDA would deliver water to that reservoir, and then that reservoir then would be your take point. So you would build a new pump station at the reservoir. That yellow line is a pipeline you would build to, again, connect to your existing pipe. And that, that new pump station you would build at the GRD reservoir would pressurize that pipeline all the way to the water treatment plant. So a lot, a lot of numbers here. Uh, you know, we did a cost comparison to these alternatives. And they're in columns, so you can see 0, 1A, 1B, and 2. So this is the cost of facilities. So you can see. Grand River or not, the baseline of this is that $76 million uh, number there. That's, that, you know, that's to expand the plant to build that reservoir. Um, and so, so that's kind of a baseline. If you go then to the um, 1A and 1B, you can see the difference is those items in the middle. It's the transmission pipelines and uh, pump stations. And so that, that's where that difference starts to accumulate. Um, 
if you add in contingencies, which you know that we always do, there's a lot of other things on top of facilities to deliver these projects. You can now see the, the cost difference. Um, basically from your baseline of alternative zero, it's basically a $26 million increase then to go to that gravity. Uh, it jumps up to 82 million when you're talking about pressurizing. And then the, the GRDA alternative is the most expensive way to go. So, you know, as, as you guys all know, I mean, cost is a really major factor, but it's not the only factor. Kenny talked about all the drivers that we had for this project. And so we worked with staff. We did a benefit cost analysis where we, you guys may have seen it before, where you can kind of quantify a system where you can kind of quantify those benefits to create that ratio and find which alternative gives you the most benefits per dollar spent. And so we had alternatives like resiliency, uh, redundancy, things like that that we scored with them. And where we ended up was right here in the middle. I mean, that partnership with UWA just really favorable for a lot of reasons. It brings you a lot of benefits. And you know, we talked about 1A being that lesser cost to get there, but with 1B being a potential long-term goal for the city to be able to deliver that full 25 MGD from UWA. And so, so we went forward with that recommendation with uh, really that alternative one, but a phased implementation of that to first go to 1A by gravity and then go to 1B eventually. And so that phasing is broken down this way. The first phase, you know, we would recommend that would be the immediate next step uh, is to have those discussions with UWA and secure a memorandum of understanding with them uh, about the, the rates, the use of infrastructure, and then about easements needed on their property to build the pipeline and begin that land acquisition if needed. So that's a, it's not a, you know, there's not a big cost associated with that. That's really discussions. Phase two then would be to address, if you remember Christy talked about that most northern piece of the pipeline is in really bad shape, so that would be to address that section of the pipeline. And even though we're going to gravity, initially when we address that pipeline, you know, it needs to be prepared for pressure service. So even though you're going to gravity initially, when you go in there and do rehab, that thing needs to be prepared to handle the higher pressures. So that's what we show there is phase two. The third phase would then be, back on that graph, it was a yellow pipeline in between. Construct those connecting facilities with UWA so we can make that connection. Once those are in place, at that point, you'd be able to deliver that 12.3 MGD by gravity. And you know, your, your average day demand is below 12. It would probably be somewhere around 12 at that time. So that could even become your primary source in, in most cases. The fourth phase then would then be now to go look at that other section of the pipeline that we know is not as bad, but we know it has a lot of problems. So do that assessment of it. it there, you can see a wide range in cost depending on what we find in there. So that, that 13 million is, you know, there's a little bit of rehab you do. The 35 million is all the way you got to replace the whole thing. So we don't know exactly where that would wind up, but that's the range. The fifth phase then would be to go up there and, and either rehabilitate your existing pump station or construct a new one. And once that is done, you would be able to pump 25 MGD. And then the very last phase is then to <coughs> expand the water treatment plant. That, that's the biggest project. It, it, it's a big project there. And you can see that cost, that range of costs over all six phases. Um, a goal would be to be in service by 2035. There's a little bit of float in that as well. But, but that's a goal when you look at the projections. Um, Here's these, these phases laid out on a timeline. And you can see that this is a potential timeline for this. And you can see that discussions with UWA to start now go into next year. Um, then you go into that phase two. And you can see that first red uh, diamond there is five years from now. And so that would be when you'd be able to deliver the 12.3 MGD by gravity. So that would be a goal to get to that point in five years. Um, the second red diamond there is starting in 2033, so that's 
you know, 10 years from now, essentially, that's when you would get to that 25 MGD point. And then with the plant improved by 2035, again, there's a little bit of flexibility there. But this, this shows how this could be phased out so that, I mean, a, that full number is too much to take at once. I mean, it's just not feasible. So by phasing that out, you can, you know, staff has time then to, to really work and get that money in place uh, to be there when you need it. And so that was really where our study ended. And, uh, you know, can I have me and staff, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, can I have Emily come up and talk about what funding we have uh, projected and that we have in our capital improvements? Hello. Um, so our we have a capital improvement spreadsheet that you guys have probably seen maybe around budget time or something like that, but we update it every year. It started back in 2013, and it's how we keep track of prioritizing projects in uh, water and wastewater and plan for future projects. We have it broken down to a five-year view, a 10-year view, and a 15-year view. And the five years, obviously, are projects we know are happening soon and we really need to plan for. And the 10 year and 15 are looking a little bit further out at projects that might happen, but we don't know an exact timeline of when they'll happen. So one of the things, one of the projects that actually has been on the spreadsheet since 2013 is at UWA, whether it is uh, rehabilitating that line, the pump station, but we had it in our minds that it would be something. <laughs> and so we actually have included uh, a little over $23 million just in the CIP and about half of that is actually included in the next five years. And so that's already been included in rate study models that we've done and um, is included just in that five year look. And then in the next six years after that, we have an additional 12 million. So the total of 23 million, which is um, very helpful when you're looking at those big numbers to know that we at least have incorporated some planning into that and have a significant amount of money that um, we can invest in that and don't have to figure out where to find it out. I love you guys for that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Great. I had a question, uh, <clears throat> just just thinking this through. I know when that was purchased, the right of way was purchased. It was supposed to be a, a right of way large enough for a two pipes to run. Now, whether it was completed that way or not, we thought we had good pipe too. I mean, you see, we didn't have. Right. So if it were, is, could we parallel a pipe yes. without replacing it? Yes. If we, uh, obviously, if we move forward with this, um, section one and section two, if we could parallel the pipe and that's cheaper, we would parallel the pipe. Um, so, yes, that would be on the table for that discussion. Okay. I, I know in certain locations, I think we only got 30 feet, but that's, that still should make it. But, um we would look at every every one that we have, every easement that we have across here. I know historically, I, I didn't know if they were here to make a presentation, but uh, when this first started years years ago, uh, certainly Mid America was really great to work with. All the years that we've worked with uh, uh, Mid America from the time that, that which started, I mean, there's a contractual agreement uh, that we would pay X amount of dollars for so many gallons. It's just I think it got to the point after a while that we were paying for more gallons than what we were actually uh, using. We thought we might be growing faster than that. But I think the quality of the water, you know, I don't know if you have anybody else making the presentation, but the quality of the raw water, there's a big difference when you start treating it. Uh, if you can get a little bit better raw water quality, then it doesn't cost as much to treat it. I think we'll still have the same finished product, but a little bit cheaper if we have better water to start with. And that's a great point, Councillor Parks. Uh, so we did have some discussions on that. Going all the way back to when we designed the current treatment plant, HDR did a lot of, they called it bench scale testing. So they went out and took a lot of samples. Uh, I think Christy talked about it here a little bit. We took more samples. We have taken samples from the Grand River uh, two or three different times. We've taken them from the Verdigree. We're looking for certain constituents uh, in that water and um, trying to see which one is actually more of a challenge. And as Christy said tonight, from an organics, and that's always a, a challenge for any water provider to treat the organics. From an organics 
perspective, Verdigree River is more challenging than the Grand River. Um, they also talked a little bit about once you treat it and send it to town, we may have to uh, adjust the pH a little bit more because it's a different pH than the Verdigree. That's all, every plant does that, every plant has to deal with that. From a chemical perspective, since the organics aren't quite as, um, like they are at the Verdigree, we may have a little bit less chemicals in uh, addressing that. So from that perspective, we agree that we think it's a, a better water source. And as we talked about tonight, right now we are on one water. We are Verdigree River. Upstream of that is the furthest inland port, Catoosa. If they have a spill, we have a challenge. And I think you had mentioned once before we actually had a problem, maybe back in the 70s or something, where we had to shut down for a few days. Right, right. Actually, they had unloaded a barge at the port of Catoosa that if it spilled for, I think it was 45 seconds, we would have been without water for 45 days. So we shut it down until they got inspectors around. It was a three-inch line with unloading hazardous waste that was going to West Tulsa. So wow. they shut it down as that because we couldn't afford to have it spill. You want to keep in mind, too, is that not to mess anything up here, but uh, <laughs> there's another port being built right across. That is true treatment plan and so you know they unload and unload a load a lot of things i'm not saying they spill anything but there's a lot of things being unloaded yeah. and there'll be a new port right again uh, across the border from our uh, intake and hdr touched on that from uh, a perspective why we fell within this uh yellow tan box if you will rectangle is because of a second source and reliability of the water uh, and treatment of the water it just gave the, the citizens the city of broken air a greater flexibility and opportunity the one thing i want to point out on here because we're always going to get sticker shock that don't get sticker shock here um, as joel said alt zero the vertigree river supply that you see the far left column there when we have to build a new treatment plant, right now we have projected, as, as HDR said, 2035 to 2040. But it's really a function of how much growth do we have that uses our water. If our growth is really in Wagner County, that's rural water four, it's not us, so our growth is a little slower. Even though we still add to our population and it, even though there's a lot more citizens around here, our water may not grow, uh, demand may not grow quite as quick. Right now our projections 2035, 2040, and we watch that constantly. I'm not seeing a huge growth in our water right now. Uh, that's why we present that once a year uh, back to the authority so that we have that record and it's a public record. We're, we're transparent with it. Um, but what you see up there, uh, I want to point out, what was that, one, two, three, four, the fifth row down, the water treatment plant expansion, that's in every alternative. Mm -hmm. If that plant gets pushed off a ways, that helps that phasing that we've talked about. And we watch that constantly right now. I do think it's probably closer to 2040 right now. That's just Kenny's opinion, um, but we'll continue to watch that. I think the biggest flexibility here Joel talked about the off-channel reservoir. Um, with the UWA and the gravity, we could gravity right into our existing reservoirs. So we've got the two big, what you want to look at, uh, a reservoir lake out there, pre-sedimentation basin. Um, we could potentially gravity directly into that, so I don't have to build a new reservoir at this time. In the future, we might. Uh, we've actually had a communication with Tulsa TMUA they actually have some land out our way. It's out on 289th, Tur Turkey Springs, if I got that road right, um, up around 61st Street. They want to build another reservoir in the future. There's a potential partnership with Broken Arrow because it, it would be four miles from me, so potentially that number of 15 million to 12 million, whatever that number is, if Tulsa's ready to go and we're ready to go in the future, maybe we join together and build a, they use a billion gallon reservoir. So Mohawk Park and AB Jewel, just right down here on County Line. Those are a billion gallons. They want to do a third one in the future. Well, maybe we, we go with them at some point in time and, and pay that portion. But that's, that's a future thing. The flexibility with uh, Alt-A, I mean, sorry, Alt-1, and A is gravity, 
is we think we could get water here, as Joel said, potentially in a four to six year period. And the 12.3 million gallons that he shows up there, that is our average day. So over the course of a year, we could get water from Uwal almost every day, except when we're in peak times during the summer, then we would offset it with vertigree. It just gives us more flexibility. The bigger thing to probably focus on is that bottom row, the cost differential. To do everything in Alt A is 25.6 million. Emily said we've already budgeted 23.1. Not all of that's in our five-year plan, but we've already budgeted uh, about half of that, I think is what she said in our five-year plan. And that's what we've been trying to keep in a five-year plan, anywhere from 12, 13 million to 15 million until we know where we're headed. So budget-wise, we're halfway there, and I probably don't have to do every bit of it immediately. So it gives us more flexibility. It's great stewardship, but more importantly, it gives us some reliability and another source water um, protecting our, our, our customers. Be happy to answer any questions. I will, let me go to, you're gonna make me jump through all these, aren't you, Joel? <laughs> what is staff's recommendation? Working with our consultant, our recommendation is to authorize us to work with UWA to see if we can get a memo of understanding that could become an agreement and start moving towards an acquisition of that property, if that's the case, the tank and the hill. We could gravity, they have, um, where Joel showed the, the Alt 1A, there's a, a hill, a high spot that's pretty close to their plant. We can gravity all the way from there into our reservoirs. That's a huge benefit. And maybe we can move forward in a phased piecemeal approach. Um, like I said, in four to six years, we could potentially be there. But it would be something that we have the authority to, or the, the ability to make that decision. The new uh, property that Davis uh, annexed in, the 1,200 acres, is that real water for or will that be on us? That, uh, anything that comes from Robinson family is in the city limits of Broken Arrow. If it goes way north, it, it would probably be in the city There's of Tulsa. There's no infrastructure out there. That so. is correct. Okay. That is correct. I do have two questions for yes, you. Yes, sir. Um, first of all, um, we were talking earlier about um, the, the vertigree um, situation where they were talking about recon possibly reconsidering because we weren't using all of our um, a lot of water. Yes. Now, if we go to UWA and make that our primary, are they going to then want to reconsider the amount they they're allowing us to have? Very astute. Yes, they could. Okay. So, under Oklahoma Water Resources Board um, and the statutes, about every seven years, as Christy said, maybe up to nine, they look at all of your water usage. Are you using your full water rights? If not, they can take those away. And we have to give projections. We just recently did that, maybe a couple of years ago. At this point, um, they're good. But to your point, if we move to UWA, if, if we got more water coming in, they could say, hey, we need to trim some of this back. So that, that's a very valid point. Okay. And my second question in these projections, does that include any kind of filter, like a biofilter that may help with uh, eliminating taste and odor? This one does not. Um, so the, on the treatment perspective, that would have been tied into the plant. I, and I saw Joel had like 85 million. Did you have any in there for? No, we, we had made the decision early on to take that out of all. To, to the all. So. It is not uh, in there, so the question is, would we want a, a biofilter to, to address the organics? I do believe that is something that needs to be uh, greatly considered and tried to be implemented. I would love to see that I don't have to do my plant expansion in 2040, and that's pushed out further, and I can put in that. But that's, that's a timing. Um, it depends on how much demand do we have on our system. So today, and I think that's the one big takeaway, we can produce 30 million gallons a day at the plant. When we did this design with HDR and the construction and it became operational in 2014, we could only do 20. We spent about six or seven million at the plant with the plate settlers um, shortly after Mr. Spurgeon got here that took us from 20 million up to 30. And we are now at the point where the plant is in good shape and we can, we can address those needs. And we did get a second um, connection with Tulsa. So we actually have some 
we're more robust today than we have been. So we really are now able to look to the future and maybe look at some treatment options. Sure. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions? <clears throat> City Manager, have any comments? No, I, I agree with everything that Kenny has presented tonight. I mean, we looked this very, very thoroughly, and obviously, I, I do think it's important to look past the, the proverbial sticker shock and realizing, I think we said our responsibility is to is to right now the time decisions that need to be made, to start the planning process for for future residents and businesses is now, and so I'd recommend ask you to accept the recommendation. Let us go forward and try to work out that agreement. I'd make that motion then we direct staff to start working with Mid America and negotiate that. I'll second it. I have a motion and a second. Roll call. You can sign in and do your motion. I tried to. <laughs> I, I will just say one thing but while you're voting is, is obviously I know the council members are going to know what this is going to cost to customers. So there will become a point when as we start to implement this is showing you what the additional cost is going to be to to our customers because obviously the ratepayers the one's going to have to pay for it so that'll be something we'll be showing you once we get a little further down the line absolutely but i really feel like they're gonna they'll pay for better tasting water which is what we're going to have at the end of this correct moving over to uwa should actually be uh, easier to treat so you may have a little bit less hardened chemical taste ultimately uh to get to the the best tasting water would be what uh, um, Trustee Green was talking about, was doing a bio filter in there as well. well. I've been trying to get that bio filter, Councilor Green, for quite a while, and I'm what, not giving up yet. What this really does is it gives us the flexibility for the future. It's, yeah. fu it's future. And we can get it to where we're in better control. Right now, we have no control. Yeah. And I do like um, having it to, like, in case something did happen to vertigrees, I like having yes, it. That's very important. That's yeah. probably one of the biggest benefits. Yeah. Exactly. Good call. Yeah, I would make a statement that my computer's down that I do vote yes. <laughs> <laughs> very, very much. I raise my hand. <laughs> I've been excited about this and this meeting for several years. Yes, you have. And I say this on the record all the time, Councillor Parks is the one who calls me at 11 o'clock at night when there's a spill or something in Independence, Kansas. He said, are you watching this? And I said, yes, sir, I am. <laughs> this, this I can say, no, I'm looking over at Grand River now, I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> we good? Okay. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do you have another motion? I'll move to adjourn. That's the motion. That's the motion. Is that all right? Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. No, this is like, is that what you're looking for? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good presentation. Yeah, that was I'm excited. really informative. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. yeah. I mean. It, Get all spread away for the meeting then? I think so. It was nice yeah. enough. It didn't work well tonight. So yeah. Was, That's good. It seems to be working now. So.